a lot of us are brought up thinking that money is a bad thing to talk about mm. and money is an ugly thing mm. and you're greedy if you talk about money especially if you're a girl it's not prey on you it doesn't look good on you yeah. you're always money minded yeah. you're always talking about money not good but uh, and i think we internalize that and we begin to you know, never ask questions that involve yeah. money and yeah. we take a lot of these things uh, in our stride but uh, it 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 hurts it hurts your interest <laughs> and welcome to the third season of anahita speaker series presented by carnegie india celebrating stirring stories of empowerment struggle and success from women professionals in different fields across the globe stories we hope are bound to inspire young professionals i am vasanti mehta intern communications and development at carnegie india today for the first anahita of 2023 We are delighted to have with us Ms. Shinjini Kumar, co-founder of Salt. Having worked in senior positions for three decades, Shinjini has built businesses, strategies, and teams across RBI, PwC, Paytm, and Citibank. To make the financial world more equitable and relatable, she is currently developing My Salt app, a fintech platform for women. So Shinjini, glad to have you here. Starting with my first question, what's your journey been like? Like starting from RBI to now building Salt, what has been a career constant for you? Thank you, Vasanti. First of all, thank you for having me here. It's wonderful to be in Delhi always, and especially in winter. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, thanks for having me here. I I'm going to tell you. about my career journey uh, from the perspective of uh, you know somebody who first came to delhi when i was 20 year 21 years old 2021 and uh, i came here to study journalism actually and um, i started out with the degrees in english literature and journalism and um, i ended up uh, getting into finance because i was this uh, bihari girl who had to write some exam because you can't be could not do that and so i ended up in rbi and it was a very good place to be because they trained you train they train you well you get uh, unbelievable exposure and for me the most uh, remarkable thing that happened in rbi was that i got to handle fdi uh, incoming you know investments into india in the 90s uh, late 90s which was the golden time for it and i i feel like a lot of my learning my personality got shaped by that experience because i got a whole lot of freedom and i got a whole lot of sense of urgency to make that happen because it was a very important point of time um in this country and um, i learned a lot it was almost like acquiring my mba degree on the job and uh, but it also made me realize that i needed to know more so i went to the us to do a a degree i did a degree in a masters degree in public policy because i always thought i would come back and you know become uh, aim for a career in the reserve bank of india which was a great career uh, for somebody like me anyway um but when i came back i was a bank supervisor i used to inspect banks and i got transferred to bombay uh i must i'm saying bombay but i think by that time it was already mumbai and we but you would still meet people who would want to call it bombay um mumbai was a place that uh, changed a lot of uh, the way i perceived my career and i'm saying this because now when i meet young people and you're a young woman especially young women i always tell them that do whatever you want to do but go to bombay if you can go to mumbai if you can and the reason i say this is because um, when i went there i realized that there was a it, it's a city that uh, just makes you uh, do many things um, exposes you to many different uh, aspects of life unlike what i had in delhi because here my circle was very you know bureaucrats government uh, public policy which was all very good but when i went there then i started seeing people differently and that in some senses made me 
uh, move uh, out of RBI because I wanted to see the rest of the world, not because I had any problem with RBI, but because I wanted to see the world differently. And uh, you only live once, so you need to do different things. So I moved out and since then my career journey has been well documented. But uh, the idea was that I promised myself I'll never get bored again. So that with that promise, I was also lucky and fortunate to find the right people who gave me the right opportunities. And um, so going through PwC, I was a partner as to head banking and capital markets. Um, I was at uh, Paytm Payments Bank, like you said, I was the CEO for the bank. And then eventually I found myself at City, which was an amazing uh, journey because uh, for the last three and a half years before I left them in 2020. Uh, and uh, I was uh, running the consumer bank. And so it gave me exposure to running a large team, understanding, you know, building uh, that business and running it. Uh, so the reason I left in 2020 is because my, you know this, but my co-founder Chaitra Chidanan uh, and Aditi Sholapurkar, I found the right set of people to do something that was a lot more ambitious, harder, but much more ambitious. So that's how the journey of Salt started. No, that that that's so interesting, and I being a part of the you know the journey like half of it it's 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 really nice but i would also actually like to know that you know whatever choices like you said that you've made in life what do you think what role does financial independence have to do with it like how how important is it for you i'd say it's uh, especially if you're a woman i think it's it's a very big determinant of your choices in life and I say this because uh, I have two sons and obviously I know a lot more men um, now than I did when I was growing up because I went to a girl's school, etc. And I realized that uh, for men, there's a lot of growing up uh, with uh, taking a few things for granted. One is that, that whatever is the family property or asset, I think they do take it for granted somewhere in the back of their head. But also they develop a risk-taking ability about money, about their career, because from childhood they are encouraged to go out and do things, break a few things, and the tolerance for that is very high. With women, there, there, is, there are many, uh, the subtle messages as well as very obvious messages are always to limit yourself. So your brother can go to, you know, go out at night and do his coaching, but you have to do it during the day. You have to find a safe place to do something, and that's the way the social reality is. So over a period of time, you learn also the same behavior when it comes to your money. money. So even when you begin to earn, because fortunately for a lot of people now, the educational opportunities are equal. A lot of families actually do treat their boys and girls um, in the same way as far as opportunities to, um, to educate yourself and build a career is concerned. So they do get there. But what ends up happening is that even if they're working, they think that somewhere the management of the family, fi family finances is the job of the man. So they, over a period of time, they somehow disempower themselves and put themselves out of that decision making. What that does is that when you are actually then making a decision to change your career or to start an entrepreneurial journey, for example, or if you're already an entrepreneur, then to expand it or to borrow or to leverage or to do various things, you're now dependent on another person. That other person may be, the, may be a very well-meaning person. You may have a great relationship, which also you cannot take for granted. But uh, even if that is the best meaning person, that person already has a very different way of thinking than you have. So you are never going to find that perfect, uh, you know, way to do this um, in the way that you would be able to do if you understood it yourself. So I know so many uh, friends and uh, people, women who are entrepreneurs who don't expand because the moment they'll say, I want to do this, the man will have, oh, why do you want to borrow? Why do you want yeah. to, uh, you know, take an obligation? Why don't you just so so they stay within those boundaries and and keep doing the the, the thing that is small, and uh, yeah, so that's part of the reason that I felt that we needed to change that because financial independence then gives you the ability. Like in my case, my husband's a professor. Uh, I've always been the person who has um, earned more money, and I definitely think that one of the reasons I've been able to make choices about where I want to live, what I want to buy what, uh, you know, what high house I want to live in or what career I want to choose. I've been, able, I, of course, I've always, I always talk to him. I'll always tell him because everything has an implication which is beyond money. Yes. And therefore you need to have those conversations. But I know that it will be my decision. So when I decided to build salt, the person who kind of I spoke to first was my mother. 
Uh, and once my mother and I had this conversation and she said, okay, why don't you do it? And I decided I want to do it. I already called Chaitra and told her I'm going to do it. And I only, you know, I was driving and I only came home and told my husband afterwards. Yeah. But I knew that he was going to be supportive once he understood what is it going to mean for, for us as a family. Yeah. So I think financial independence, uh, particularly for women, is very, very important for many decisions. And we are talking about all these good scenarios. And I'm giving you my example because it is a good scenario. But I know so many women for whom just walking out of a bad marriage is a very, it's, it's an impossibility because they have no idea where they'll go next. Yeah. So those are like the really difficult situations. Yesterday I was talking to a very accomplished woman, admirable in every way, but uh, she said she married her childhood sweetheart and one fine day she found herself, uh, uh, you know, walking out of the house and when they decided to split, turned out that there was no investment in her name and she was working. She was working at a, you know, one of the world's largest technology companies, but she had nothing in her name. Yeah. And that's where she had to start from. Yeah. And there's so many, many stories that you hear about this. So it's about life as well as about profession. Your choices become better if you understand money. And I'm really like, I do want to say this very assertively that a lot of us are brought up thinking that money is a bad thing to talk about. Mm -hmm. And money is an ugly thing. Mm -hmm. And you're greedy if you talk about money. Yeah. Especially if you're a girl, it's not prey on you. It doesn't look good on you. Yeah. You're always money minded. Yeah. You're always talking about money. Not good. But, uh, and I think we internalize that and we begin to you know, never ask questions that involve yeah. money. And yeah. we take a lot of these things uh, in our stride. But uh, it, it, it hurts. It hurts your interest. So you don't have to become money minded, you, but you have to develop your uh, you know, understanding of money and you have to be able to uh, get very basic uh, insights, which are not hard. Yeah. Actually, women manage a lot more money than men, than do. men do. Women take many more decisions about money than men do yeah. from morning to night. But when it came, comes to wealth, when it comes to assets, when it comes to inheritance, when it comes to passing it on, when it comes to big decisions, that somehow passes on to women. And that, I think, is uh, it affects your ability to succeed, your ability to make other people succeed. So today, if I can, uh, you know, I can take an independent call if I meet a young person and I see that they are doing something which I like, I can take an independent call to tell that person, hey, I want to support your business, I'd like to invest in I can do that because I have the money, right? Um, I know friends who are very well, who would like to support me, but they have to ask their husbands, even if they have their money, because that's for the money decisions that they can in their house. So I think seeing all of that, I, I and I, at the same time, we know many women. I mean, if you see our company's cap table, we have many women investors. And I think these are women that have been able to, you know, make decisions for themselves that... Um, that have the financial independence to be able to do this. And over a period of time, these things begin to change the world because yes. the world needs to have more equity. Yeah. The world needs to have, that's why we always say in a very simple way, our vision is to have more wealthy women. Yeah. So that's it. Yeah. 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 No, that, that, that's so great. And I, I love your insights on that. On similar lines, I want to know that what salt really means for you and for someone watching, you know, the term, the aim that you want to achieve with the company, because I've often seen like the branding being associated with salt has to bring out a revolution. Because salt has always been a very important part of, you know, historic revolution. So what does it mean for you? So we call it salt because it does stand for a revolution. Many revolutions have had salt making as a part of their, yeah. uh, you know, uh, statement, um, including Gandhi, uh, who is a big personal uh, inspiration for me. Um, I did go to Sagarmati before I started salt. So I don't know if you saw that blog, but yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, salt also because uh, it's, uh, it's essential. And uh, you may be a hippie, but you first need to own the Ferrari to sell it. So you need to have some understanding of money because you will still need some money. So yeah. I, I felt like, I, so we felt like salt was something that stood for a lot of how we thought about money because we never thought about money as the primary ingredient in your life. So salt, you cannot eat a spoon of salt as a meal, but you, but if you don't have it, then there's no taste in your food. Yeah. So also the balance, right? You need to always have it in balanced yeah. way. You cannot have too much of it. You cannot have too little of it. The so salt is a very interesting commodity. Also, a lot of the world is made of salt. Yeah. Also, we want salt to be in every house. Yeah. So, so yeah. salt stood for a lot of things that we were 
talking about and that's how the name came about and we realized that what we were wanting to do with women and well um, the, the terminology of salt spoke to a lot of that so yeah. our, our logo is the salt crystal yeah, so yeah. the seven crystals yeah. of salt yeah. constitute our dynamic logo our color is uh, from the deepest part of the ocean which is uh, uh, you know which also stands for the ocean has the salt yeah. So all of these uh, beautiful things came together. So it appealed to our aesthetic, it appealed to our philosophy, it appealed to the psychology of money that we wanted to build around. So that's a brilliant uh, name. It's just that it's a common name. So every time you say we are building salt, there are some 13 other salts that people will be building, which is okay yeah. because, yeah, it's, a, it's such a universal name. Uh, yeah, but we love this. Yeah, I know. And like that, that is so fascinating because salt also means different things for different people like for me it means like you never really estimate how much you want to put in food mm -hmm. like it's always it's so always intuitive it's always so the, exactly yeah, yeah it's right. always intuitive right like yeah when you put all ingredients will be measured exactly but salt but will be to taste yeah because your taste yeah. for salt will be yeah. different from my yeah. taste for salt yeah. which is also very true of money yeah you know the money is such an interesting thing that um you know two of us may have the exact same information yeah we may be sisters yeah but the decision that we will make about our money will be very, very different mm -hmm. because yeah. you will come from your psychology and I'll come and from my psychology. So it's uh, it's not at all logical. Yeah. No, but that is so fascinating. And Chinjini, just if you allow me to take the conversation in a little different direction, um, what do you think the like the agenda now India's taken its G20 presidency and if the presidency actually stresses upon digital public goods and uh, infrastructure? Do you think that this can have an impact on women and you know the financial ecosystem? So uh, I think you're putting two things together. One is the what are the areas in which India uh, aspires to or considers it practical to take global leadership, right? Because yeah. a position to be the leader at G20 implies that uh, that's that's where we are, and we are a country that is um, poised to to you know just keep doing better because of our demographic because of what we have but also because of a lot of the core technology infrastructure that this country has built right so um so one of our biggest success stories is upi it is the ubi ubiquitous nature of digital payments in this country yeah. so you know practically everybody who comes here is amazed at uh, the coconut vendor taking um, paytm um, or, uh, you know, Google Pay or, you know, that that's one of the things that we have done, which is um, impress. And uh, when you want to be stand on the world stage and talk about uh, what you have done and what you can do, uh, you will pick things that are that where you already have an advantage. So our advantage traditionally in India has always been labor, whether it is cheap labor that migrates to the Gulf countries and uh, sense remittances or whether it is the highly qualified CEOs that are exported you know, early on from India and then end up becoming CEOs of large global companies and a lot of talent across the world goes from India. So we've only been a country that has showcased to the world talent. Uh, it has showcased to the world volumes and over the last few years we've also started to showcase to the world not exactly the core technology that we are building because that's still uh, coming from uh, largely from the US, but um, a lot of what that technology is capable of, what that technology can do to change the lives of very large number of people, millions of people, billion of people, how that technology can actually be uh, used in a manner that is not, uh, uh, you know, that can become safe. So we've always had concerns in India because there's a very large number of people that use these digital products. They're not always very, they're very eager or easy to share data because they, they are just, you know, they think they're getting something and therefore for 20 rupees they'll give you access to uh, their personal data and things like that. But now we are getting to a point where we are becoming better understanding those issues and addressing those issues. So there is the whole digital infrastructure, there is the whole system of consent that we are building, and there is the data privacy bill. And I think between these things, so the availability of core infrastructure, availability of a formal mechanism to share that data with consent, and the availability of legal protection for it are 
the building blocks of a insane uh, type of public good that can be built by other people on top of that. And when I say that, um, why is it insane? It's for two reasons. One is that we have we never became the manufacturing driven economy that other countries, you know, when, when we were young, we used to be taught economics and the, the whole cycle of moving from agriculture to manufacturing to services, right? India didn't do that. And there are, I'm not saying that's always a good thing. There are poor consequences of that. We've lost generation of people that, uh, you know, that have been poor. But having, being where we are and having seen the shift in technology that's already happened because we have leapfrogged two digital technologies, we can't now miss the bus to not make more people, not include more people and not create well-being for more people using the technology that's available to us. And I think that's one of the things that we are doing better than we ever did with manufacturing because we missed that. So I'm just hoping that this leadership at this time and the availability of this infrastructure and this legal mechanism uh, and a large young population, which is very intuitive to you know, mobile to uh, and the availability of cheap data, all of these factors sort of conspire to make us, put us in a very good position to scale uh, the, the benefit of technology to a large number of people and include. I've said all the good things. I am assuming you have a follow-up question where I can also tell you some downsides, but yeah, it's not, every, everything needs to be done with, uh, you know, a good understanding and intent. Yeah. Oh, no, for sure. And personally, I've always wondered what, you know, how DPIs and DGPs now are going to look like for India when that, the and also our viewers, a lot of the young people would also be. I want to take uh, the question to a little uh, on the pandemic end of things of, you know, how that you think that infrastructure, which we spoke so much about right now, was it easy for women to now start taking money decisions actively or did the pandemic really add to the problems or the hindrances that women had earlier on. So what do you think? It's a very good question. And let me just take you back to uh, when demonetization happened. When demonetization happened, I was, uh, you know, I had the opportunity to work with a few people who were working on um, exactly the impact of the demonetization on women. And it was heartbreaking to see how many women had lost their money because they typically saved in cash. And the reason I'm going back to that is because what, what happened in the pandemic was a little bit of the opposite. Mm -hmm. What happened during the pandemic is that uh, women were able to actually upskill themselves a lot more. And you suddenly started to actually see that because they they instinctively are better organizers and they were able to, so many building societies, so many groups of women were having these Google forms where they were collecting orders and they were able to get you know stuff for their, because they needed to run their households, right? And so they were, they suddenly became a very active part of that digital uh, community, which earlier they may have been using as users, but now all of a sudden, because commerce was shut down, because travel was shut down, they had two things. They had a little bit more time as well. And they also had the, uh, they had the need to find, um, you know, sort of hacky solutions to running the households or to doing, or to getting their children to uh, do their homework or to study, etc. So a lot more engagement with the mobile in a very much more productive way than just the social, which tends to be a lot of the, the time, the primary source of engagement. So a lot of women actually learn uh, to uh, use uh, these, these uh, digital products. So I think that was a very good thing that happened. But even more interesting, what happened was that many people had the time to actually look at their uh, portfolios to understand wealth because also sadly, uh, when people were, uh, you know, losing their near and dear ones, uh, there was also this realization of that vulnerability and the dependence on money and things like insurance and do I really understand uh, what I have and what can I do when there is an emergency in the family? There were so many stories. I mean, I know people who were wealthy enough to, to actually, you know, pay for anything, but at that point of time, because the, the man who had all the passwords and who had all the, um, you know, access uh, was not there anymore. They didn't have uh, the ability to pay hospital bills and other people were paying hospital bills for them. So there was this very uh, unfortunate way in which I think a lot more women realized that they needed to uh, start uh, accepting that they, they needed to know more. 
and uh, therefore and it also came to the men right because we used to do these clubhouse sessions and i remember um, men asking uh, you were there i think in some of them and men asking that uh, you know i feel worried that if something happens to me my wife won't know what to do yeah. so can yeah. you please uh, tell her so I think both ways, this became a very important realization. People were worried about their children not knowing what to do if something was to happen to them. So I think the pandemic acted in a way that it did bring a lot more focus and attention on money in a way which was different from the uh, pre-pandemic. Because pre-pandemic, we used to talk about, uh, you know, buy now, pay later, uh, credit, uh, payday credit. It was a lot built around consumption and credit and building a lifestyle. I think during the pandemic, and hopefully it will last, it became a little bit more about prudence and understanding and money and growing your money and wealth. And also the markets helped, right? Because yeah. the markets went yeah. through this yeah. uh, phase where they yeah. created opportunity for many people yes. to participate and make yes. more money. So you saw this expansion in the market. And I think this is here to stay. It isn't yeah. something which is a reversible trend. Definitely. It is something which will stay. And uh, therefore, a lot more women uh, also is a very logical uh, sort of uh, thing that is going to happen. It was one of the things that prompted us to build salt, like, you know, because when we called, when I called Aditi, that Chetra and I have spoken and we want you to be a part of this, uh, her primary thing was that since the pandemic, she was in Singapore and she had been talking to uh, young, uh, you know, colleagues of hers who were all MBAs and everything, but they had never taken done anything about their money and now they had the time and they wanted her to do master classes so she was actually doing master classes on investing and that's why it's all yeah. came together because it was so timely so again that happened everywhere you suddenly saw a burst of um, you know fin influencers yeah uh, a lot of them Definitely. women and uh, a lot more conversation around this so i think this the pandemic has been quite a game changer for uh, for everybody but uh, also in this stress regard yeah. But if you allow me to push the conversation uh, towards a little bit around, uh, you know, fintech and products for women. So do you think that how can we really encourage, you know, innovators, entrepreneurs to actually build financial tools and, you know, products for women? And I want to understand is also that what is different in women's finance? Is it a matter of, you know, how products are built for them? Or is it a strategy how to market those products for women? So I just no great question. Uh, it is both. So okay. uh, first of all, build for women because they're fifty percent of the world's population. So you and you know you will uh, find new clients. Uh, the second, the reason that we thought we should be building for women is because women's financial lives have never really been understood by the mainstream financial system because the mainstream financial system developed and evolved along with, you know, industrial revolution and uh, people going to work and earning a salary and, uh, you know, making long-term commitments to save, create a retirement corpus, take a home loan, pay it over monthly mortgages. So everything is built around the idea of a monthly income. Everything is built around the idea of long-term uh, long ability to earn money and then retire and have to spend it. That's how financial system was built. Women never lived that way. They never had the luxury to work for 30 years and then retire. If they went into a workplace after five years, they had a child, they took a gap. If they ever came back, then they started from a very different position. So that it was not taken for granted, which is why uh, not, you know, women continue, continue to be a very small portion of the formal financial system's consumer base. When you want to expand that, when you want to build for this consumer, first of all, don't go and... Uh, try the same tactic that everybody else has tried. So the microfinance actually was one product that was built for women and it actually did very well from every perspective. Of course, technology changes and what they're doing now is different from what they were doing earlier. But you find that uh, this idea of uh, building for a consumer who is whose lifestyle is different, whose uh, life needs are different, whose time, who's a time poor customer, uh, whose decision-making may be different, is something that you need to understand when you build for this woman. But it's very rewarding to build for this consumer because this consumer has been demonstrated to be a long-term consumer, has demonstrated to have high lifetime value, is demonstrated to have high reference. So even in our case, when we build the money personality test mm -hmm. and when we put it out um, into the world, we realized that women's uh, referral um, you know, ability was going up to eight people. So every woman that took the test reached out to eight people who took the test whereas for men that number was four mm -hmm. so so i think women take their time but their uh, decision making journey is different 
So that is these are the things that you need to understand. And therefore, the products require some tweak as well because they need to be suited to this uh, consumer. But the more important thing is that the solutioning around the product and the distribution of that product and how that sales journey is created needs more trust, needs more transparency. A lot of women we spoke to who have money but delegate the decision to their men because they have a fundamental discomfort with people who are selling these products. So they would rather avoid it than you know engage with it. So I think there are things that you need to know and understand, uh, but it's worthwhile, as I said, building for it because it is a high revenue, um, high revenue client group to crack because of their longer lifetime value, especially for something like finance. Because yeah. in finance, finance is a lifelong product. It's not like you know diapers or uh, things that you will use for a certain period of time, uh, and that's why it's worthwhile. Yeah, no, that's that's really fascinating. And on similar similar lines of actually product building and you know fintech or things fintech i i would just want to know your insights and you know your take on what you think are some fintech trends that we need to look out for 2023 oh um one of the biggest trends will be that everybody has been so focused around becoming unicorns that over the last few years people have been much more focused around raising capital and uh you know scaling I think, uh, and then regulators have come back and changed a lot of that game because, you know, in credit, they have come up with new regulation and they're looking at um, you know, fee structures of uh, interchange, etc. So what you will now see, actually, in my opinion, will be people uh, actually trying to solve real problems, trying to get more, uh, uh, you know, think about more monetization, think about uh, creating value for clients. So I'm, I'm hoping that uh, that is what we will see. Um, like you said, uh, because of the availability of digital infrastructure, there will be there is a lot more openness also from the side of regulators to to give you sandboxes to allow you to do some new things. I wish there was more of it. I mean, I don't think it's nearly as much as uh, it is required to be for a country that has problems of the size and magnitude that we have. But um, I, I definitely think we are moving in that direction, and we will see more. That is, I'm so excited for 2023. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today, Shinjini. This was such an interesting conversation and I'm sure your valuable insights will give women the confidence to actually take charge of their money actively. And, lead and men, I find a lot of young men actually <laughs> are like women in their money attitudes. <laughs> they want somebody else to take care of it. And <laughs> I, I mean, I can say this because when we were building for women and a lot of people used to challenge us, why are you building for women? And uh, we realized that uh, that was true because a lot of the young men yeah. wanted the same flexibility in their lives that women have always had. Yeah. And so that's why our platform is not close to, yeah. we are dedicated to yeah. women, but we are not uh, exclusive to women. Yeah. So we do find, uh, you know, 30% of our clients are men. Thank you so much for joining us today, Shinjini. This was such an interesting conversation and I'm sure your valuable insights will give women and men the confidence to take charge of their money and lead them towards their financial independence. I hope our audience enjoyed this episode. Do subscribe to Carnegie India's YouTube channel for more such content. Thank you.